week, I pulled back up the musical Hamilton on Disney+. Plus. I'm one of these people who's a fan of Hamilton, though I have never seen it in person, and probably will never be able to afford to see it in person, frankly. But um, I rewatched the first act in part because I uh, am listening through a book that tells the story of how Hamilton came to be written, the, the, the musical. Um, it's really a, a fascinating book. I've, I've been loving listening to it. And one of the things that, as is always the case when you kind of listen to some of these behind the scenes things, you start to notice things you didn't notice before. And I didn't really notice the lengths that the author went to to try to show how things that seem inevitable to us now weren't then. Like it wasn't inevitable that America was going to win the war. It wasn't inevitable that uh, a strong central democracy was going to be the form of government that took root. It wasn't inevitable that a central bank was going to be created, the thing that actually really bound us together. Um, it, it, all of these things that on this end of history seems like that was what was always going to happen. At the time, it definitely was not. And it's kind of interesting as I was watching it, it, po- it pulled me back to the very first time I watched Hamilton, which was the summer it came out on Disney+. Plus. It was the summer of 2020. Anybody remember that summer? I remember as I was watching it this week, it's sort of like emotionally I was pulled back into the sense of uh, lack of clarity and no sense of equilibrium or solid ground as I was reflecting on the moment we were in as a nation as we faced this pandemic and we didn't really know how it was going to go. And I think at that point we still thought it was like a day away from being over, but we didn't know how it was going to go. And we were in the middle of a really intense political season, and we didn't really know how it was going to go. And we were in the middle of uh, this sort of moral upheaval surrounding race and issues of, issues of race, and we didn't really know how all that was going to go. And it was kind of fascinating to me to reflect on this story that's meant to highlight how um, tenuous things were in the beginning was a story that I watched for the first time in a moment that was really tenuous in our time. And just to, to, to make a comparison to, to sort of our text today, where we're going today, the early church, when Paul's writing this letter, they're in a similar moment. There are certain debates that were going on in Paul's day, like the debate that is sort of the center, central theme of this message, that seem on this end inevitable. It seems inevitable that they were going to, to resolve the way that they did. But at the time, humanly speaking, it was not. This place that the Galatian church found themselves in, right in the center of a conflict, could very easily, humanly speaking, have gone one way or another. Because this is where the Galatians, the receivers of this letter, they found themselves. They found themselves triangulated. Anybody have the experience of being triangulated before? I'm just, just so we're on the same page. Being triangulated means there's two people in conflict, and they pull you into the conflict because each of them want you to be the deciding vote in their favor. So sometimes as a pastor, not often, but sometimes as a pastor, someone will come to me for counsel on a conflict. But what they really want is for me to be on their side against their spouse or their kids or their parents or their neighbor or their coworker, and it always ends really well. (laughs) So the Galatians, they find themselves in the place where they're being triangulated. On the one hand, they have the Apostle Paul. Some few years before he wrote this letter, Paul showed up in the region of Galatia, um, East Central Turkey nowadays, and he went to at least three of their major cities and he proclaimed the good news that Jesus died for their sins and rose again, and that anybody who would repent and believe, trust, that this work Jesus has done is the only way we can be forgiven and accepted by God, anyone who would respond to the gospel in that way would be forgiven and accepted by God and belong among his people. You can read about this, by the way, in Acts chapter 13 and uh, 14, which you should do because some pretty crazy stuff goes on while Paul is in Galatia. But the short story is he preaches this message, and people are responding. People are repenting. People are turning away from lives of idolatry and sinfulness, and they're giving themselves all the way to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is coming, and marriages are being restored, and families are being put back together, and unjust business practices are being left in the dust, and men are actually being faithful to their wives, something that was unheard of in that day. And so many things were happening as evidence that the Holy Spirit was falling on these people. So after some time preaching this message, Paul helps them organize some little churches, which were sort of like support groups to help people continue on in this newfound faith after Paul and his team had left, which, by the way, is sort of how churches are still meant to function. And he uh, puts together these churches, and then he leaves, he and his team, and they go back to their home church, their sending church in Antioch, 
which is in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. So, some time passes, we don't know how long, and some people show up in Galatia, and they too are preaching what they call the gospel. And it's similar to what Paul preached in some ways, but it's really different in others. Now, we have to do a little bit of reverse engineering to try to figure out what exactly it was that these other people were preaching, but we can have a pretty good confidence that they were saying something like this. Jesus died for the sins of the Jewish people and rose again. And the good news is that anyone who will repent of their non-Jewish identity can be saved and accepted by God. Here's what this means. Um, for starters, if you're a man, you have to be circumcised. And then you, now, then you need to begin to follow our holy calendar, Sabbaths and new moons and all the feasts and festivals, and submit um, to our dietary laws. Those are sort of like the three big things, and anybody who will do those things can be saved because of the work Jesus did. Now, we don't know what the response exactly was in Galatia. We don't know if some people went in on that. We don't know if it started the first church split. Like there was on the one side of the street, the first church of the circumcision, and on the other side was the first church of the non-circumcision. We don't know how they handled it. We don't know if they started. Could you imagine getting this mailer, by the way? Come out to our fall festival. We got a dunk tank. We got enough food for everybody. There's going to be games for the kids, face painting. There's going to be all sorts of fun stuff to do, and the circumcision booth will be open until noon. We don't know how they responded to it, but it created some sort of turmoil in the church in Galatia, and that report got back to Paul, and that is why Paul wrote this letter. Now, here's the question that I think we can reach for a little empathy, because, I don't know, maybe you're not like me, but I read this kind of stuff, I'm like, how foolish are these people? But we reach for a little bit of empathy. The question that they're asking at this point is, which one of these two groups is right? Or maybe a better way to put it is, which one of these two groups is reliable? and trustworthy in the message they've brought. Because here's the thing about these folks who brought this other message. They have really good scriptural evidence to back up their claim. In fact, and this maybe is what they did, if they called together a Bible study and they opened up Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and just did a Bible study, there would be all sorts of passages in there where God directly says you have to be circumcised to be a part of my people. And there's all sorts of passages in there where God directly says you have to Sabbath and you have to celebrate the new moons and you have to keep these specific feasts if you're going to be a part of my people. And there's all sorts of passages in there where God directly says there are certain types of foods you have to abstain from if you are going to be counted among my people. There's great scriptural evidence for the message of this other people. So which one is right, or maybe better put, which one is more reliable? And so that's where Paul goes in this next part of his letter that we're going to consider together today. He's going to tell a part of his life story to demonstrate or to back up a claim that he makes about himself, a big, massive, hairy, maybe even ridiculous claim he makes about himself to prove that he is the one that should be listened to. It starts this way in chapter 1, verse 10, when he says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I, were try, if I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Here's where Paul has come. He's, he's telling these people, look, you, you can believe me. I'm not preaching this message to you in order to gain a following. I'm not preaching this message to you in order to get the applause of human beings. I'm not preaching this message to you in order to get famous or to feel good about myself because a lot of people follow me or follow my message. That's not why I'm preaching this message to you. I am preaching this message to you because I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. Let's maybe just for a minute get into that word servant. Last week I did one Greek word. This is the only one I'll do this week. I don't know if I'm setting a precedent for the rest of this series. We'll see. Paul says I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. We we don't have in our time and place, an exact parallel for what Paul is saying when he uses that word. It's the Greek word underneath the word servant is the word doulos. And more often than not, that had to do with somebody who had found themselves at one point in a place where they had a debt they could not pay. So in our time and place, if you have a debt and you can't pay it, you get to a certain point and the creditors are kind of done with extensions and that kind of stuff, and you can file for bankruptcy and there's that sort of protection. If you're a fan of the office, you know that bankruptcy is nature's redo. It's actually not true. If you're thinking that I'm giving you financial advice, I am not. But in this time and place, there's no 
protection for that kind of thing. And so if you got to a point where you had a debt you couldn't pay, likely what was going to happen is you were going to go to prison for a very long time corresponding to the level of your debt. And that would be the way you would basically pay back your debt. That's part of the reason why we use the phrase pay back a debt to society nowadays. So in some instances, somebody who uh, was really wealthy and had the means to do so would step in and pay off the debt on behalf of the debtor, in which case the debtor would become a doulos to the person who paid their debt. They would become, maybe the better phrase is, a bond servant. And they would spend some portion of their life, usually a pretty lengthy amount of time, and usually corresponding to the size of their debt, serving, working for, giving their whole, whole lives to this person who paid off their debt. And so when we understand this, it makes perfect sense why Paul would consider himself a doulos of Jesus Christ. Because he has come to realize that there is a debt about him that he cannot pay, that he's hopeless to pay off, and yet in his mercy and grace, Jesus steps in on the cross and pays his debt for him, with the result that Paul is now a doulos to Jesus Christ. And everything that he does, right down to preaching this message throughout his travels, is meant to serve not the applause of people or what will gain a following, it's meant to serve Jesus. That's the life of a doulos. I now live in no way for myself and only for the goodness and in service to the one who paid my debt for me. Paul goes on. It's not just that. It's not just that I'm working and operating out of a desire to serve Jesus. He says, For I would have you know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, Paul, just hold up a second. Because this is like the ultimate Christian trump card, isn't it? I didn't get it from anybody else. I just received it directly from Jesus. You feel free to disagree if you want, but, you know, Jesus told me. And Paul understands this is a huge claim, so he's just going to lay out the events of his life. He's just going to lay out how did he get from where he started to the day he showed up in Galatia preaching this message and show that the only possible explanation is that Jesus himself intervened. Here's where it picks up. Verse 13, for you've heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. There was a time in Paul's life where he was a rising star in Judaism. A lot of people looked up to him, even though he was pretty young. He's like the model Jewish man. This is the kind of man we need to be producing in our synagogues and in our temple. Like this guy right here, he's so zealous, he has given his life to protect the purity of the Jewish faith. And primarily, he does that through, by any means necessary, opposing and attempting to destroy the proclamation of the gospel. Remember, at this time, Christians were thought of as like a rogue sect of Jewish people. And so here is Paul's desire to to stamp out this movement, this false teaching, and bring these people back into a right expression of faith through things like circumcision, the Jewish calendar, and dietary restrictions, all the things that make one religiously Jewish. Paul was so zealous with these things, he felt like he was right to engage violently in a campaign to destroy the church. Just as an aside, This is why Paul, back in verse 10, says, if I were still trying to please man. Because now, with the benefit of hindsight, after his conversion, after a very humbling encounter with Jesus Christ, he can now see that what he was doing before was not actually motivated out of a desire to worship God. He was before working for the applause of men, and he was getting it. He was one of those rare people who actually succeeded in setting himself apart as a model Jewish man. So what motive would he have to abandon all that to become a servant of Christ? He was indebted to no one. He was exactly the right kind of person within his faith. And so as he engages this campaign to stamp out this church movement, he leaves Jerusalem one day. Um, You can read about this in Acts chapter 9, by the way, which you should do. And that's published about 15 years after this letter, so this is the first telling of this story that we get. Paul leaves Jerusalem on this campaign to stamp out the church. He leaves the place, by the way, where all of the leaders of the church are. 
He leaves the place where the apostles, the disciples, um, Peter, James, and John, the really famous Christians, he leaves the place where they are. He's on a mission to go out to some other cities and to stamp out this movement, the church. When he arrives at the first city that he was headed towards, Damascus, he shows up a completely different man. For one thing, he's physically blind. He didn't leave Jerusalem that way. And for another, he shows up a man passionate about preaching the gospel he once tried to destroy. He shows up a man who no longer looks to his Jewish heritage and his faithfulness to a list of ceremonial regulations before God. He shows up a man who has repented of that life where he was succeeding at being a good moral person and going all in on Jesus Christ. Now here's the key that Paul lays out for this argument, why you should believe him. At that moment, he doesn't go back to Jerusalem, go to Peter, James, John, or any of the other leaders of the church and say, teach me everything. Tell me what I need to know. Give me the message. How can I go be faithful in proclaiming this message to all the cities that I was once traveling to to destroy it? He doesn't go to any of them. In fact, he continues on into obscure places, obscure places, In the eyes of this movement that's beginning in Jerusalem, he continues on to these obscure places, and for 14 years, he preaches the gospel. He stops preaching these religious traditions that he so zealously pursued in his youth, and he preaches there is only one response to the good news, that Jesus has died and risen again, and that is to repent and believe. For 14 years, he preached that message, and the Holy Spirit came indiscriminate of somebody's uh, ethnic background, socioeconomic class, gender, none of it mattered. The Holy Spirit fell anywhere somebody responded to the gospel in repentance and faith, with one exception. Somewhere about three years in, Paul gets run out of another town because the people that once saw him as a rising star are now trying to kill him, and he goes to Jerusalem. He spends two weeks there hanging out with Peter, and he meets James, and then Some people there want to kill him, and so he leaves there too. He has a very short time in Jerusalem. Almost nobody in the church understands who he is or knows him by face. The only thing they know about him is this person who once was violently persecuting the church is now preaching the gospel he once tried to destroy. And they worshiped. Some of you this morning have family members Children, spouses, parents, neighbors, friends, and you have been praying for them and engaging them on behalf of the gospel for so long, and you're starting to wonder if they are just too far gone. Don't despair. If Paul can be saved, anybody can. If Paul can be used to proclaim the good news of the gospel to the nations, anybody can. If Paul can turn, by the grace of Jesus Christ, from violently opposing the church, from dedicating his entire life to, by any means necessary, destroying the church, anybody can. Don't despair of praying. Don't despair of sharing. Don't despair of engaging your loved ones with the good news of the gospel. If Paul can be saved, anybody can. For 14 years, Paul travels in the fringes of this region and proclaims the good news. Jew or Gentile, indiscriminately, repent and believe. And the Holy Spirit was coming and lives were being changed and the proof was in the pudding. People were really being saved. But this debate that the Galatians find themselves in the middle of started to reach a little bit of a boiling point. And humanly speaking, it kind of seemed like this early, young, fledgling little church movement was on the edge of a knife and it could go one way or another. This whole question of what does it mean to be forgiven and accepted by God could go one way or another. We could revert back, chapter and verse, the first five books of the Bible, all that we could revert back to God is the God of the Jews. Jesus was a Jewish Messiah. Jesus was circumcised. Jesus followed the Jewish ceremonial laws. He was a Jewish Savior, and so it could have gone that way. And so after 14 years, Paul finally goes up to Jerusalem. It's time to have a talk and to figure out if we're all on the same page with this message we're preaching. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking taking Titus with me. All right, a little something about Titus. 
Titus is not a Jewish man. He is a Gentile man, which is just a colloquial way of saying he's not Jewish. He was not circumcised. He did not Sabbath or follow the Jewish uh, calendar. He did not observe, as far as we know, any of the dietary restrictions of Jewish people. He was eating pork left, right, and center. This dude is not Jewish. So just like, like put yourself in Titus's sandals for a minute. As he's walking to Jerusalem, where this intense conversation is coming that has an enormous bearing on his life. He has been told that he is right with God on the work of Jesus Christ alone. But that all might be about to change. The nature of his relationship with God might change drastically depending on how this conversation goes here in Jerusalem. And I think it's immensely important to us to always remember that when we're having theological conversations about what God expects and demands of us, real people are involved. We, we can forget at times and think of it as sort of like a detached emotional or academic exercise. We can talk about an issue like it's just an issue, and then we can put it back up on the shelf and go home again and just forget about it. But real people are at stake when it comes to the proclamation of this gospel, when it comes to getting this message right and refusing to add anything to it. They get to Jerusalem. Paul says in verse 2 that he puts the gospel before them. This is what I've been preaching. This is what I've been seeing with my own eyes. This is evidence that God is at work in these people regardless of the fact that they are not Jewish and not trying to be. Jump down with me to verse 6. We'll come back to the intervening verses. Here's the result of this conversation. And from those who seemed to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. That's so Paul. Yeah, they're like apostles and famous Christians, but you know, God doesn't care about that. That's true, but this is a very public document. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. In other words, your proclamation of the gospel needs no amendments, no addendums, no postscripts, nothing that is added on to repentance and faith as the one thing that the gospel demands. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and to me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Let me just paraphrase that because Paul has the same tendency I have, which is to start stacking up phrases and then the sentence becomes completely unintelligible. The proof is in the pudding. The same Holy Spirit who is falling on Jewish people when they repent and believe is falling on non-Jewish people when they repent and believe. Miracles are happening Families are being restored. People are turning away from their sins. 14 years worth of evidence shows me, Paul says, that the Holy Spirit is not expecting us to become Jewish in order to be saved, and therefore, who are we to add that to the gospel? So, Titus, no doubt rejoicing over the summary of this conversation, verse 3, even Titus who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Here's this great test case of a young man who is preaching the gospel. He's going to end up being a pastor in the, on the island of Crete, but he's preaching the gospel, and he's, he's doing the work, and he's got the Holy Spirit, and he's repented, and he's believing, and he's trying to, to figure out this work, walking with Jesus thing, and nothing needs to be added on top of that message to him. Here's what did happen in the middle of that conversation. Look with me at verse 4. Yet because of false brothers, secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them, if you um, highlight or um, underline or circle in your Bible, let me encourage you to highlight, underline, or circle this verse. To them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Because here's how this could have gone. We could have made some concessions. We could have said, let's agree to disagree. Let's create a couple denominations. 
you know, you guys do your thing on Sunday, we'll do ours. Maybe we'll do a Christmas Eve service together or kind of check in along the way to make sure, you know, we're still good and we'll keep up community. It'll be okay, but you do your thing, we'll do ours. Or, or maybe we could have made it into a matter of personal conscience. Maybe your faith compels you to respond to the gospel by being circumcised and by following the Jewish calendar and Jewish dietary restrictions. We'll just kind of agree to disagree. Just, just let it be. Just You guys live your life and we'll use ours. Why fight about it? But here's what Paul understood. That a gospel corrupted in one generation cannot go forth to any others. He understood that more was at stake than even just Titus who was in that room, but the Galatians themselves and all others that he would preach this gospel to needed someone to stand up for the truth of the gospel and refuse to yield in submission even for a moment. This is why the message that the Galatians received from Paul, all of this, by the way, happened before he ever set foot in Galatia. This is why the message that the Galatians received from Paul is one they can rely on, because it has been kept pure. And here's where I want us to find some comfort this morning. Because I know the stats. I know about the deconstruction and the ex-evangelical and everybody leaving churches, and I, I know all that kind of stuff. And I think this is a moment where we first, as Jesus instructs us, have to look at the log in our own eye. And we have to ask questions about ourselves. And we have to look at our message. And we have to look at our community. And we have to make sure that what we are doing is faithful and true and the pure gospel that has been handed down to us. But look at this moment and see that even though, humanly speaking, it seemed like the future on the church, of the church was on the edge of a knife, it was not. Because the Holy Spirit was in their midst, guiding the church toward the truth of the gospel. And for generations, for centuries since that day, men and women have refused to yield in submission even for a moment to the many different ways that we might corrupt or add to this gospel so that 2,000 years and 6,000 miles away from this moment, we stand here in Gainesville, Florida 2022 with the gospel of Jesus Christ being proclaimed. The church is not fragile. I don't know what God's plan is for Creekside specifically, but the local church is not fragile because the local church has the Spirit of God moving in and through it for the proclamation of His gospel. And any church who will cling to this good news, who will cling to a posture of humility and repentance and trust in Jesus Christ alone is going to be just fine because the Holy Spirit is in us caring for us. And in fact, we now have Gainesville, Florida 2022 with whatever little church and kind of a little place in, in the world and whatever length the, uh, the reach of our influence has, which is not big, but it is what God has given us, we now have an opportunity to join in that legacy of refusing to yield even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved. And I don't think that it is a danger for most of us to believe, as the Galatians might have believed, that we need to become Jewish in order to be saved. That's probably not a pressing temptation for us right now, but that doesn't mean there aren't other ways that the, the gospel might be corrupted in our time and place. Because we're in a moment, and you, again, talked about this earlier, but we're in this moment where we're in this, what, what one uh, Harvard uh, political scientist calls a moral convulsion. Interestingly, you can track these throughout the history of America. About every 60 years, there's this kind of big upheaval where the establishment and the established practices and everything is evil and everybody's mad and it takes about five, 10 years to sort of work itself out and then we have some peace for a while. And we're in it right now. And the temptation right now is for us to wade into the cultural fights with the Bible as our trump card and begin to make ourselves one or the other of the answers with Jesus as our mascot. Now look, let me preempt some of the emails that are coming. The Bible has something substantial to say to every single one of the debates that are going on right now. And our world will suffer if Christians sit on the sideline. Okay? My concern is that we will inadvertently elevate some of these current issues that are fraught in our moment, 
and communicate to people that in order to belong in this church or to Jesus Christ, they have to repent of their sins and their party affiliation. They have to repent of their sins and their views on critical race theory or nationalism. They have to repent of their sins and what they think about gun control. These are all things the Bible has something to say about and many more issues we could bring up. But the purity of the gospel is this. Anyone who will repent of their sins and believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ will be saved, full stop. And I am anxious in my role as a pastor, one of your pastors as I stand up in here, that we would pass on to our children not a special interest group or a political action committee, but a church that proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, we step towards our neighbors. We step towards our community around us. We speak truth in grace and in love, but we never, ever, ever confuse what is the gospel and what is not. We never confuse what is required to be good with God and what is not. Because, though it may not seem like it, because all the stats say they're all leaving, the next generation is watching us. There are children in our church today, right now, in this service, that are watching to get a sense for what it means to be a Christian. And what it means to be a Christian is to respond to the good news in repentance and faith. Jesus is the only grounds on which we can be forgiven and accepted by God. And it is on those solid words we stand. It's one thing to say it from up front here. It's actually a whole other thing to do it in the way that we live and treat each other. And that's what we're going to talk about next week as we continue our journey through the letter of Galatians. Let me pray for us. God, our Father, how faithful are you to your church that over generations, over centuries, with all sorts of attacks and threats from within and without on the gospel, that we stand here 2,000 years and 6,000 miles away and we hear the good news that Jesus died for our sins and rose again. Who are we that you would intervene in history to preserve that news for us? Father, I ask that as we walk through this letter to the Galatian church this fall, that we would be filled with your spirit and renewed in our conviction to protect the purity of the gospel in the way that we live and treat each other, in the way that we love one another here inside this church, in the way that we love our neighbors as ourselves, regardless their affiliations, regardless their beliefs, regardless their decisions, that we would move toward them in love just as you moved toward us in love while we were still enemies. We ask, Father, that you would do a new work in churches all across this country and this world, that we would never tire or be bored by focusing ourselves on the good news of the gospel, that we would become, dare I pray it, even as passionate about the good news of the gospel as we are about our favorite sport team or about our political vision for this country or about anything else in this world. Would you capture us by the goodness of the love that you have shown to us through your son Jesus Christ? that while we were still sinners, he would die for us to pay off our debt and come alive again with a new identity that is pleasing and acceptable to you that he offers to us for free. God, I ask that you would protect me and us in this church to be a people who are not pulled down into the moments of this world and forget the fact that the kingdom of God has come And the king is alive. And these things that we talk about are matters with consequence. Absolutely they are. But may we talk about them in the context of Jesus, who has died from our sins and risen again. We ask this for your sake. In your son's name, amen.